message. Shall we begin and uh, moving worship by singing hymn number 36? Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. Welcome to the Camberwell Evangelical Church, those in the chapel here and those watching online. We trust we will be blessed with the word of God this morning from our elder, Mr. Stephen Whitten, and there will be fellowship afterwards. This evening's service at 6.30 will be Mr. John Gardner, our other elder. That will be then followed by the open air meeting in the local proximity, and fellowship again continues there. On Tuesday at 8 o'clock will be our Bible discussion group continuing in the book of James. And on Wednesday at 7.45 is our Bible study and prayer meeting. There will be no children's club, uh, evangelistic children's club on this Friday or the following Friday as it's a uh, break up from schools. But there will be the men's evangelistic uh, outreach in Ruskin Park around about 11 o'clock-ish. Depends on what time they all get up, I suppose. Um, yeah, that will be on Saturday morning. Now, Friday morning, here in the chapel, will be our Good Friday service at 10.30, uh, and that will be followed by the Lord's Supper for all those who know the Lord Jesus as their God and their Saviour. That's Friday, 10.30 here. Next services on Sunday, Easter Sunday, will be at uh, 11 o'clock and 6.30. Um, now, Missionary Week next week, the box will be at the back for all those who wish to contribute uh, towards uh, Philip Baptiste or the Zambezi Mission. Uh, that will be available next week, so pray for that work there. 
Um, I'm just trying to wreck my brains now for anything else. I think. Is there anything else, brother? No, I think that's it. If there is anything else, it will be given tonight. See you then. Bye. Shall we sing our second hymn, hymn number 50? The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. <laughs> reading this morning is found in the book of two kings the book of two kings and chapter two and we shall be reading from verse nine to the end of the chapter and in the church bible that is on page 413 413 in the church bible just brief way of explanation uh, it is my intention God willing, on Sunday evenings when I'm preaching, I will be going through the book of Judges. But when I'm called upon on Sunday mornings, I shall be doing one-off sermons from the Old and from the New Testament. Just in case anybody does wonder why I'm not doing the book of Judges this morning. Uh, also, a brief um, update on our pastor. He's still very unwell. He visited the hospital last week and they've provided him with some new treatment but him and Daniel certainly need our prayers at this time and pray that God will undertake for him and if people are concerned please come and speak to either myself or John or indeed anyone else in the diagonal and we will give you all the information that we possibly can because obviously people are concerned about things and you know do come and speak to us we will hopefully at least be able to keep you up to date with what is happening. Well, anyway, as I say, our, our first reading there 
is in the second book of Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 2, reading from verse 9. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah part, sorry, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and hither. And Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold, now there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord have taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, Ye shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. And they sent therefore fifty men. And they sought three days, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is naught, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the springs of waters, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters, there shall not be thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked upon them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two of them. And he went from thence down to Mount, Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. Amen. We trust that God will bless his word to us this morning, and now shall we come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, as we come to thee this morning, we bring thee praise and worship. We think, our Father, of that first hymn that we sung together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And Lord, we join in that hymn and our lovely Lord to start the service with praise and worship to thee. 
acknowledging again our Father that thou art a holy God thou art thrice holy Father, Son and Holy Ghost well Father the mysteries of the Trinity may be beyond us but we say amen to the truth that it is so our God is one God and yet in three separate persons and Father we praise thee we worship thee this day we acknowledge, Father, that we can only come through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him. We thank you, Father, for that sacrificial life. Next Sunday, Lord, it shall, we shall be remembering Easter Sunday, the wonderful resurrection of our Saviour. On Good Friday, uh, it was so cruelly treated of men. But we remember, Father, it was all for us. His death so that he could bear in his own body our sins, that we might be acceptable, that we might become indeed sons and daughters of God, forever pure and holy in thy sight. And we acknowledge, Father, that that is our only form of access to thee, the fact that our Saviour died in our place, and now, Father, that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Oh, we praise you, our Father, this day, we praise you for such a wonderful gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, for the gifts you provide for us every day. Lord, for the food in our homes, for the roof over our heads, for clothing, for families, for loved ones. Lord, all these things you provide, and so often we confess we take for granted. But Lord, we remember we live in difficult days. There are some, Lord, maybe in our own congregation who are struggling with, with the effects of the financial situation. Lord, we pray for any brother or sister in need that you would undertake. And Father, you, indeed, you would open the eyes of your church to realise that. We pray, Father, indeed, for this time when people are struggling, that those who are not saved, that they might seek thee. Oh, Father, that men and women, boys and girls, would seek unto thee. Father, thou art a gracious God. We pray that even in such days as this, people might seek after thee. Father, we know it is a work of yourself. The scripture tell us that no man seeketh after God. Therefore, any that do, we know it is an absolute work of yourself. But be gracious, Father. Bless this church at Camberwell. We thank you for the many blessings of the past. And yet, Lord, we look for blessings in the future. We ask, Lord, that you would add to our number. We, we pray, Father, that we would be a church that loves you greatly. We thank you for the fellowship that we have. But we pray, Lord, that that would increase. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't sit back on past blessings but that we would look to the future. That, Father, we would look for days of great increase, days of worship and days of praise. We commit to you to come in holiday special and pray, Lord, that you would bring the right amount of children in. And, Father, if it please you, that there may be a harvest even amongst them. Remembering too, Lord, the Friday club and the football club, and the tracks that are given out Sunday morning outside the church. And Father, as we go to the open air meeting, even this evening, Lord, use the work of thy people. Use the work of those who go forth with the gospel, that we may come rejoicing and praising thee. And then our Father, we do pray again for our pastor. We pray that you would undertake for him at this time. Look upon that situation. We pray, Father, that you would be very gracious. We pray, Lord, that you would grant him and Daniel much wisdom. And we pray, Father, that they would be free from discomfort. Oh, Lord, be with us in this morning, we pray thee. Undertake for us, Lord, in all our needs. But be amongst us to bless us, we pray thee. Because we ask it all in that glorious and victorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our third hymn is from the screen. My God, how wonderful thou art. Yeah. 
Also found in the second book of Kings, but it is chapter 4, chapter 4, 2 Kings, chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 38. And in the church Bible, that is page number 416. 416 in the church Bible. Two Kings, chapter 4, reading from verse 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and sieve pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lapful, and came and spread them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said unto them, Bring meal. And he cast it into the pot. And he said, Pour out for the people, that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. And there came a man from Belshazzar, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What, should I set this before a hundred men? And he said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat, and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Amen. We trust that God 
will bless his word to us this morning. And now before the message, shall we sing together hymn number 677. 677. We love the place, O oh God, where in thine honour dwells. brief history into this passage before us this morning. As you know, after the death of David and Solomon took over, and then after Solomon, his son Rehoboam. But after that, Israel was divided. Israel was divided into two parts, basically Judah and Samaria. Judah had several good kings. We think of Asa, Jehoshaphat, and indeed there, there were others uh, as you go through the scriptures. So Judah did have several good kings. But sadly, Samaria, or the other ten tribes, they never had one good king. Not one good king. Some of them appeared to maybe be good to start with, but they never followed God. They followed the sins of basically worshipping the golden calf, which Jeroboam had set up. He deliberately set out to stop the people of God going to Jerusalem. And therefore he set up the golden calves, and that was the state of Israel until the days when they were carried away. I say that because... When we look at these two men today, Elijah and Elisha, they were incredible prophets. But they were prophets to Samaria. So they were prophets to the people who was always away from God. They was always testifying against the people of their day that they'd forsaken God, that the kings had been wicked, the kings wasn't following God as they should have done. And Elijah... And then Elisha continually brought before them their sin and told them that they needed to repent. Well, you, I'm sure some of you are aware of Elijah. I suppose his most well-known piece was when he challenged the prophets of Baal on top of the mountain. He poured water on the sacrifice. And then they said, the God that answers by fire, he is the God. And that's exactly what God done. He burnt up the sacrifices. Then he killed all the prophets of Baal. 
and the prophets of the grove. But then he was chased away by a woman whose name was Jezebel, who was a very wicked queen. So the life of Elijah was about to come to an end. But as everything in the scriptures, there's always, it, life carries on. And in a sense, it's been a very difficult year for many people in this church in many different ways. Some have suffered the extreme of losing loved ones. But others, people's situations have changed. And as a church, it is obvious that if not now, but in the coming days, we are going to have change. We can't get away from it. I was talking to Sister Monica beforehand, and we were talking about old age, and you, you can't beat it. You get older, you become weaker. You have various illnesses. The muscles that you once had become saggy, and the strength that you once had departs from you. That is all part of life. But God's work continues and life goes on. And this is what we, we see today in our first reading. Elijah was going to be taken up to heaven by God. We don't, we don't actually know how this was known, but it seems that everybody knew beforehand that Elijah was going to be taken up into heaven. And indeed, as him and Elisha was walking along together, going to various places, the people kept saying to Elisha, look, Elijah's going to be taken up today. And he said to him, yeah, I know, please keep your peace. Please keep your peace. And so they kept saying, and eventually, as we saw, they come to the River Jordan. We didn't read this particular bit together. They came to the River Jordan. Elijah smote the River Jordan. The River Jordan opened up, and him and Elisha passed over. And then our reading began where Elijah says to Elisha, what, what do you want me to give you? What would you that I should do for you when I depart? I'm about to go. What is the one thing that you want from me? And Elisha, being a man of God himself, he said, well, look, what I'd really like is to have twice as much of the spirit as what you've had. What a lovely fool. What a lovely fool. Elijah had been, he'd been so used of God, but Elisha, he said, I want double of that. I want double of the spirit that you've had. What a lovely fault for us all. That we might pray that in the days to come, we might have more of God's spirit. And let us not make the excuse that it's not possible because Jesus himself said, if we ask for the spirit of God, as God is our heavenly father, he will give us the spirit. And as a church and as individuals, that is certainly what we need to pray for in these days, the spirit of God. Because that's the only place where there is power, as it were. Yes, there's power in the word, but the word is made powerful by the Spirit of God. So they walk along together. He's asked him for this request. Elijah says, well, look, if you see me when I'm taken up, if you actually witness me being taken up to heaven, then you will receive this blessing. But if you don't see me taken up, then you won't, you won't get the blessing. And they walked along together. And as they walked along and talked, maybe Elisha was asking him advice about what he should do when he does go. But as they walked along and talked, all of a sudden, the fiery chariot came down and fiery horses, and it said it parted them asunder. It was as if here they were, they were talking, and all of a sudden this chariot came down, and Elijah was taken up to heaven. Of course, some people today would say we were foolish to believe this, but we believe this absolutely happened. There's no doubt in our minds at all. This was an actual event. It's not a fairy story. It is a part of biblical history that Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot. And Elisha witnessed it. And as Elijah went up, his cloak, his mantle fell off. 
And Elisha, seeing this, rent his clothes with sadness for the departure of his friend and indeed his instructor. And he cried out that his master, the, the chariot of God and the horsemen thereof. In other words, although Israel had never had a good king who could fight for them, they did have a good prophet. And you could say that you didn't need a good king or even an army if you had one man like Elijah who was near to God. He had been the chariot of Israel. He had been the horseman near Rod. He had been the one thing that had kept Israel safe. And now the Lord had taken him. And so there was much sadness with Elisha. But the good thing was, Elisha did see him depart. And he remembered the promise that as a result, he would receive a double portion of the spirit that Elijah had. So Elisha puts this to the test straight away he picks up the mantle he goes back to the river Jordan and he strikes it on the ground and he says where is the Lord God of Elijah and as he smites it so the waters open up again showing as evidence that yes God now was with Elisha and God would bless him and he, he passed over and then we're told that there was a school of prophets, rather like what we would call today a Bible college. There was a Bible college, and it was in Jericho. That in itself is interesting. We're going to look at that in a little bit more depth. But these, these people from the Bible college, from the school of the prophets, they were watching. Because they all knew, as I said, they seemed to know beforehand what was going to happen. And they were watching afar off. And they saw what had happened. They saw the chariot come down. They saw Elijah taken up. And they acknowledge and they actually say the spirit of God that was on Elijah is now on Elisha. And they come to meet Elisha. But immediately, immediately, you see people, as it were, wanting to grasp on to the past. They'd acknowledge with their own eyes, yes. The Spirit of God's now on Elisha, but what do they say to Elisha? What's their first request? Oh, look, we've got 50 strong men here. Let them go out and look because God might have put Elijah on a mountain somewhere. Maybe the Lord didn't actually take him up to heaven. Maybe he just took him up for a small period. And if we go and look for him, we can find Elijah. Maybe he's still there. You can see that they, they, they couldn't deal with the fact that Elijah had gone. It was a great sadness to them. And it can be with us. We can often cling to the past. But in a sense, we need to look to the future. And you notice, Elisha says to them, no, don't do that. Don't go and look for him. You don't need to. He's not there. He's in glory. And that's another truth for us all. Those brothers and sisters who've left us, they're no longer here. They're in glory. They're in a far better place. Given the opportunity, they definitely would not come back. I say again, it's easy to say when we've not recently lost loved ones, but the truth remains the same. Elijah now was in heaven. And of course, it ties up with what we see in the New Testament where Peter was on the mountain with Christ and Moses and Elijah appeared unto him. Well, he says to him, no, don't go look. But it says, they kept on at him till he was ashamed. Meaning they kept saying, no, go on, please, please, let's go and look for him. And maybe making out that, you know, look, you just want to take over. You, you know, please let us go and find him. They kept on so much that he was ashamed and he said, okay, okay, go and look for him. If you want to go and look for him, you go and look for him. So these 50 sons of the prophets, they went out and they searched for Elijah for three days. And after three days, they came back and they said, we can't find him. Well, there you go. 
that shouldn't have been a surprise, but there, there it was. They couldn't find him because the Lord had taken him up into heaven. Now, as I say, let's come back to these actual people. This was a school of the prophets, and it was in Jericho. Now, again, those of you who know the history of Jericho, originally it was destroyed under Joshua. It was one of the first big cities that God destroyed as the people entered the promised land. And Jericho was totally destroyed. Rahab was spared and her family because she hid the two spies. But Jericho itself was destroyed. And Joshua put a curse on it. He said, cursed be this city, let it never ever be built again because it's such a bad place. But in the days of the kings, someone did rebuild it. And the curse was this, that whoever rebuilds it, when they lay the foundation of it, let their firstborn die. And when they finish the city, then let their lastborn, as it were, die. That was the curse. And that's exactly what happened. Jericho was rebuilt. The man who built it lost two of his children in doing so. But Jericho was built again. This cursed city that was never meant to be built. But this is the good side. That sounds all gloomy, but in this city that had been cursed, in this place that had been a place of great evil, and even in these days, more than likely still wasn't a good place, there was a school of the prophets. As I said, there was a Bible college in Jericho with a hundred young men who were studying the word of God, who were seeking God under the prophet of Elijah. And now Elisha was about to take over as head of all those schools of the prophets. Because there wasn't just one they, they were scattered all throughout the schools of the prophets. And praise God, once again we see the truth that no matter how wicked a place, God has always got his people in it. God will always have his people everywhere on the earth. Sadly, we have brothers and sisters in other countries. We've never met them, but we know they're being persecuted even today. We have a great liberty and a freedom to come to church. We should use that because brothers and sisters are risking life and death to go to church. Surely we can come to church with no fear of persecution. There's an onus on us to serve God while we have such a liberty. Well, as I say, this was good. The school of the prophets in Jericho. It has now dawned on them Yes, Elisha has definitely took over from Elijah. And immediately, now they have a request for him, which wasn't a bad thing. Some might say, why did they never ask Elijah to sort this problem out? It would seem to me, and again, this is only my own opinion, I'm sure you'll study it and you might come up and disagree. It seems to me that generally speaking, Elisha, was a more approachable person than Elijah. It might be because Elijah had been known for calling down fire, not just on Mount Carmel, it also burnt up several, uh, at least two captains of the host who'd come to take him. Elijah indeed was a prophet of fire. And maybe, maybe the sons of the prophets was a bit afraid to approach him. That's a possibility. That's something to think about. But they approached Elisha and they said to him, look, and this is in modern English, this is not an exact quote. They said, look, this is a lovely place where we live. It's very pleasant. It's a lovely place to live indeed, but the water is no good. The water is sour, it's bitter, and as a result, we can't drink it and the ground is very barren. And so, can you do anything about that? And he said, well, he gets a cruise and he puts salt in it 
and he throws it into the fountain and immediately the water becomes clean. Now you can see from this that Elisha straight away improves the situation of God's people. He makes God's people benefit from that. And there's a spiritual picture in there as well, of course. The spirit, the water, is always a picture of the spirit of God. And the idea that because it was in Jericho, because it had been a cursed city, the water wasn't as pure, it wasn't as nice. And you can have that in a church. You can have a real church, but where the doctrine has been affected over the years, it's not as healthy as it was. It's not as beneficial to the people. Elisha, he put the salt in and the water became good. And now there was more blessing for the people of Jericho. Amazing. This city that had once been cursed, now not only did it have a score of prophets, but it had a beneficial water system that would profit them physically via food and drink. This again, is, this is the first miracle that Elisha had done to benefit the people of God. So he leaves Jericho, that cursed city, and he makes his way to Bethel. Those who have been coming on a Wednesday night know that Bethel was the place where Jacob said, this is the house of God. But again, Bethel had gone away. Bethel had gone away from the Lord. And as he's going up towards Bethel, these young children come out and stop mocking him. They start mocking him, I should say. I have to say, this is the only thing I've got in common with Elisha that people have called me baldhead before. And uh, that's the only thing I've got in common with him. Go up thou baldhead. They said, go up. And they were saying this mockingly. They knew that Elijah had gone up to heaven. They'd heard the story. They didn't believe it. That's why they were saying it in a sarcastic way. Why don't you do what Elijah done? Go on, go up to heaven, baldhead. We don't need you here. Clear off. Now we see a side of Elisha, which was very similar to Elijah. He turned round, he looked at these children, and he cursed them. He cursed them in the name of the Lord. We know from the scripture that the cursed calls list will not come to pass. In other words, if it wasn't right what he'd done, it wouldn't have happened. But the fact that it did shows that the curse was indeed of God. And these two bears come out of the wood and attack these children. It says they tear 40 and two of them. Some have suggested that maybe none of these children died at all. Maybe that they was just all injured. Some have said, no, surely all 42 of these children died. But if you look at it, it was, you can see the contrast of this man of God. One minute, he's healing the waters of this city. The next minute, he's cursing these children. But what we need to see from this for ourselves is, if our children are not brought up to respect the things of God, the things they might say may bring trouble upon them. These people had no respect for God. They came from Bethel, which at one time was called the house of God. But now they come to mock a man of God. We cannot make our children and grandchildren become Christians. Of course we can't. That is a work that only God can do. But what we can do is instill within our loved ones a fear of God. All right, you might not be a Christian, but show respect to the things of God because disrespect can bring with it trouble. So that's the beginning. Now I'd like you to turn with me to that last passage that we read together, and that's in 2 Kings chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Kings chapter 4, and we read from... Verse 38. This again is two events. It's all to do with food. It's all to do with Elisha providing for the schools of the prophets. This was another school of the prophets. 
And it says, Elisha came again to Gilgal, and we see again there was a dearth in the land. So there was famine. There'd been a drought, and as a result of the drought, there was nothing growing. Food was very scarce. And I say again, although this was physical, it portrayed the spiritual state of the nation at the time. There was a drought. There were very little things concerning the things of God that were good. There was a spiritual drought and there was a physical drought. There was a dearth. And the sons of the prophets were sitting there and they were waiting to be taught and instructed, but also they were waiting to be fed. There was a hundred of them. These men, there was a hundred men still in this place who did love God. They was eager to be instructed in the ways of God. But they needed physical food as well. So he says to his servant, put the big pot on. It reminds you sometimes in the old days, you know, when your mum done a stew or, or whatever. And certainly, I'm showing my age, but you go back in the old days, that's what people would do. They would get Sunday's joint, what was left of it, put it in a pot, put all various veg and stuff with it and stew it up. Put the pot on and whatever food we've got, we'll put in the pot and at least we can have something to eat. And some of the young men, they went out to look to see if they could find anything else to put in this pot. And we're told that this young man, he went out, it says he went into the field. Now, generally speaking, and again, I'm sure some of you have checked this, but when it talks about the field, it is often a picture of the world. A picture of the world. He went out into the field, and it says that he gathered her. He found a wild vine. Of course, we know Christ is the true vine. This man found a wild vine. And he found things on it, and he thought, oh, this looks good. There's a lot of it here. And he got a lap full. So he, he gathered these gourds, he put them in, he filled his lap up with them. He went back to where they was all waiting to eat, and he ground it into the pot. He put it into the pot and mixed it in. He thought he was doing good. He, he didn't do this with bad intentions. He thought he was doing good. He thought he was going to feed the prophets. But instead, what he didn't realise, what he'd put into the pot was poisonous. Not only wouldn't it do him any good, it would make him ill. And I'm sure you can already see the spiritual picture. We live in days of a spiritual dearth. And as a result, sometimes people are looking... They're looking for new things. They're looking for encouragement. They want to bring something to the people of God that will encourage them. But sadly, if not checked, people can bring into the church things that are not profitable, teachings that are not good. And you'd have to say, in some of the teachings, there is death in the pot. Any doctrine that comes into the church which is contrary to the fundamental teachings of the scriptures, i.e. the sufficiency of Christ's death alone, the truth of the fact that our God is a triune God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, and the fact that our God is sovereign in all things, this is just a, a picture of how fundamentally these truths are. And anything that detracts from that brings death into the pot. This was a physical death. This, this man had done this with good intentions. He hadn't done it to poison his friends, but he'd done it to make the pot look bigger so there was more to eat. But sadly, it wasn't going to help them, it was going to poison them. And as, one, as the first one put his finger or a spoon into the bowl he tasted it and he cries out there is death in the pot his mouth was sensitive and we should be sensitive spiritually to what people say we should have a sensitive taste 
to the things of God. Is this of God? Is this according to the scriptures? Will it benefit us? And once again, Elisha, he takes some meal, he puts that in the pot, he mixes it in, and it's okay. And there you see the picture there is of a man of God who keeps control of what people are taking in spiritually. He makes sure that the things that people are taking from the church will be beneficial to their soul. And this is what Elisha done. This was his second miracle. And again, it was to do with feeding the people of God. And lastly, we're told that there came a man from Belshazzar. I'm sure that's not pronounced correctly. But this man anyway, he brought with him bread. Now again, time defeats us as usual. Because Israel had gone away from God, in the old days, when a person would do their harvest, they would take the first fruits of their harvest and they would take it to the temple. This is what was done. They, they would bring it to the priest. The priest then would bless them. They'd do the sacrifice and that's how it was. But Israel was so far away from God, they wasn't allowed to do that. They wasn't allowed to go to Jerusalem for certain. So what the people of God would do, who still wanted to bring their offering to God, they would take it to the people of God. And i.e. the best place to take something was to the prophets, to the school of the prophets. And so this is what this man does. He comes to Elisha. He said, look, here is the first fruits of my, of, of my land. I want to give this to you. I want, I want to give it to you. Now, it says that there was 20 loaves of barley and four ears of corn in the husk. Now, apparently, this wasn't a lot of food at all. Brother John, on Wednesday, mentioned about the young boy who came to Christ with them few loaves and fishes. Well, if you think that little boy had some loaves, in the plural, what do you think of a loaf? They couldn't have been big loaves. And here's a chap, he's brought 20 loaves. But really, that wasn't much at all. So again, he gives it, he uses the word servitor. It just means servant. It was his servant again. And he said, look, this man's brought this food in. Get it ready, prepare it, and give it to the sons of the prophets. And he said... I can't give this to 100 people. There's not enough here to feed 100 people. It's impossible. Again, showing that Christ's miracles always outdo the miracles of the Old Testament. This indeed was a miracle because 100 young men was going to be fed with a few loaves and some husks of barley. But nevertheless, it powered into insignificance compared to what our Lord done with just a few loaves and fishes. So Elisha says to him, no, you give it to them. Not only will they have enough to eat, there will be leftovers. And sure as the man of God said, everybody ate to the full and there was food left over. Just like it was with the feeding of the 5,000 that afterwards they picked up that remained and there was 12 baskets left over from the feeding of the 5,000. And even here, there was food left over. Once again, Elisha, under the power of God, was able to feed the sons of the prophets with a miracle. So we see on three occasions, he cleansed the water at Jericho. He, pured, he, he made pure the pottage that they ate. And now he fed them with a small amount of food. And so it is with God's people today. God will always feed them. And for us, there's an encouragement. The Lord will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, you may be fearful about the future. But the promise of God is this, not only will he give you enough, 
you will have enough and to spare because that is what our God does. So may we, in the days to come, know God's blessing upon us. May we know much of his spirit and may we see much blessing upon his church. Amen. And we're going to close with this lovely hymn, We Rest on Thee. Father, we thank you again for your precious word. 
We thank you, Father, for so many, many promises. Oh, Lord, grant us that faith that we may grasp those promises, that we might know a peace and insurance in our own lives. Father, do indeed save our children and our grandchildren. Have mercy upon them, we pray thee. Father, go before us now this day to bless us, because we ask it all in that glorious and victorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.